This morning's Torah portion is called Re'e. Who knows what Re'e means? See the spiritual eyes. That's right. <laughs> now you know where to look each week. It means to see. And we're going to be talking about seeing intellectually as well as seeing spiritually. And ultimately, we want to move from just a head knowledge of Hashem and His ways to a total spiritual understanding and application of it in our own lives. So this Torah portion can be found in Deuteronomy 11 verses 26 through chapter 16, verse 17. And a little overview of this parasha. We've got about five chapters. And in the last part of chapter 11, where we start our Torah portion, you're going to see the blessings and the cursings reiterated from last week. And remember, Israel was told to go up onto Mount Gerizim, six tribes on Mount Gerizim, six tribes on Mount Ebal, and they would pronounce the blessings and the curses of um, keeping Hashem's ways, curses that we naturally bring upon ourselves if we live out of harmony with the source of life, blessings if we learn to live in harmony with the source of life. So we're going to look at this, and it's interesting that when they actually do it, you don't see the blessings literally spelled out, <clears throat> they're implied. They go more into detail as into what happens if you don't keep Torah. Chapter 12 is how to live in the land where the yod heh vav -He, Hashem has placed His name. In chapter 13, we see how to live by God's Word without adding to it or subtracting from it. Moshe really goes into detail about how important it is to just keep what God has given us, not adding to it or subtracting from it. And warnings about those who would draw you away from the truth. In chapter 14, we see laws for conduct uh, and the laws of kosher or kashrut, which we call uh, eating clean animals, and also the laws of tithes, taking care of the priest in chapter 14. And in chapter 15, we see the laws reiterated of the Shemitah year, which is every seven years and also caring for the needy and the servants. And we're going to incorporate this into our understanding of what we need to be doing during this month of repentance. Do you know that caring for the needy and the poor is a big part of the righteous deeds that accompany true teshuva? So there's not only a repentance of turning away from the errors of our ways and returning to the source in Torah. But as you see that the very foundation of Torah is selfless love, and love is a verb, it's an action word, it's serving all of God's children. So the righteous deeds are equated with tzedakah, with that charity that I mentioned earlier. That goes hand in hand with teshuva. And then in the very last chapter, chapter 16, we see the laws for observing the holy days throughout the year. And it goes into detail about the three holy days in particular that all men are to present themselves in Jerusalem three times a year. So with this month of Elul that we're entering into first in mind, the creator of the world has a plan, and this plan unfolds as we begin to observe his holy days. You can see that every holy day, every Moedim, every appointed time is foreshadowing a future event. And the spring feast are foreshadowing Messiah's first coming. The fall feast are foreshadowing Messiah's second coming. And in this Torah portion, we see that every choice we make either fits into the plan or it doesn't. It's either going to naturally have the cause and effect of bringing blessings into our life, or we're going to experience the natural cause and effect of being out of harmony with the source of life and selfless love. So here's a little diagram of this month that we're entering into. And as you can see, this is when Moshe ascends for the final 40 days. Did you know that he went up onto Mount Sinai three different times of 40 days, fasting without food and water? And we're entering into the period of Moshe's final 40 days uh, up on Mount Sinai. And he finally descends after making intercession for Israel and knowing that God is going to atone for Israel's sins. And he descends on the Day of Atonement and gives them the good news. Well, this solar eclipse is occurring Monday, the 1st of Elul. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as the scriptures, that we observe the new moon, the new month, in the conjunction of the month. That way, also, the holy days are in the full moon period. So this would be Monday. 
and you start counting 40 days of repentance and we're to blow the shofar each day of these 40 days leading up to Yom Kippur. So we've got a little man blowing the shofar here. It ends on the 10th of Tishri, which is Yom Kippur. So this is a very significant month. Each day opening with a shofar blast and we recognize three main attributes in this month that we're also going to see hinted at in the Torah portion. <clears throat> it's a month of enhanced relationship with Hashem. So we're going to be talking about relationship. It's a month of Teshuvah, which means to return. Not just to turn from your wicked way, because you could turn from one wicked way and go right into another wicked way, right? It's all about returning to the source. And it's a month of kindness and righteous deeds called Sadaka. So we're going to see Moshe, as he's reiterating these laws, he's actually going through a theme of relationship, and then repentance, and then a theme of righteous deeds, and then reoccurring, doing that three different times throughout the Torah portion this morning. Elul is the month preceding Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is when our sages say God created the earth. It is also known as Yom Teruah, the day of trumpeting in which Messiah will return in the fall, in some future fall. And 40 days before Yom Kippur, Elul begins and is considered a month of desirous drawing near to Hashem in relationship, repentance, and righteous deeds. According to tradition, several biblical verses hint at the centrality of these desired behaviors as Elul is actually an acronym. It is spelled... with an olive and then you have a lamed and then you have a vav this is the oo sound and then a, a lamed again so I'm writing it down this would be equate to our s sound with the vowel underneath it and then this would be our l sound this would be a oo sound with the dot there another L. So we're going to look at different scriptures that actually the sages have found that there is an Aleph followed by a Lamed, followed by a Vav, followed by a Lamed, and it hints to these three central aspects of Elul. Here's the Song of Songs 6-3. Everybody knows this because we sing it on Erev Shabbat. Lecha Dodi. Song of Solomon says, Lecha dodi ve dodi li. I am my beloved, and my beloved's is mine. Do you see the Aleph, the Lamed, the Vav, and the final Lamed? This might be able to be seen easier if I do it this way. Ani le dodi ve dodi li. You see Elul hidden within the scripture. And it's all about relationship. It's all about intimacy. Hashem desires for us to draw near to Him. And this is why He gives us the laws. The laws are not rules and restrictions. The laws are laws of love in how to purify ourselves and return to be beings of light so that we can draw near to Him. Because light cannot coexist with darkness. So right now, as much as He would like to have intimacy with us, we're not ready for that kind of in intimacy. It would be like a consuming fire to us. So He gives us His laws which prepare us to return, and this is the process of being recreated in His image, the image that Adam was created into and lost through sin. He is taking us through a process of purification to come back so that we can have intimacy with Him. This is the most widely known acronym, and this verse is often inscribed on decorative wedding bands. And it's interpreted by the rabbis as an expression of the subliminal and mutual love between God and the people of Israel. This particular verse is suggestive of communication also, because no relationship is built without communication. And we communicate with the divine through prayer. The next verse is Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. And it says, Then Hashem, your Elohim, will open up your heart. It's like He's going to be circumcising your heart and the heart of your offspring to love Hashem, your Elohim, with all your heart and all your soul in order that you might live. And you have, Umal Adonai Elohecha et levavcha va'et levav zared. And you see the olive, lamed, 
Vav Lamed. And what is it talking about to circumcise our heart? To draw us into repentance where we have a soft enough heart to be willing to change because w without baby skin on our heart, we're just going to continue in our rebellious way. So here it's amazing. Elul is even hidden within Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 and identifies our need for teshuva, for repentance. Circumcision is symbolic of the covenant between Hashem and the people of Israel. And in this verse, circumcision of the heart is envisioned as preparation for living a fuller life. This is what Yeshua was talking about when he says, I come to give life and give it more abundantly. The weekly portion that includes this verse is always read on the last Sabbath of this coming month of Elul shortly before Rosh Hashanah, just to remind us that we need to, if we're going to enter into this period where we are going to see Mashiach come and be anointed as high priest and king, we need to have a heart of repentance and to return to Torah. The final acronym that we found is in Esther, chapter 9, verse 22. And it speaks of sending portions to one's friends and gifts to the needy. And what's amazing is this covers the deeds of the Daka, the deeds of righteousness. And you can see the Aleph, I've enlarged the Lamed, the Vav, and the Lamed here. And although the original context of this verse relates specifically to the celebration of the festival of Purim, where we send out gifts to our neighbors and to our friends who we know are in need, it also embodies a timeless lesson in generosity and kindness, which fulfills Torah and develops human relationships and in the taking of responsibility for the weaker members of society. So it's beautiful that we have Elul hidden within text about relationship and intimacy, repentance, and the need for doing righteous deeds. So think about these three things in, over the next 40 days and how you're going to live out each aspect of these uh, three aspects. And we're going to look in the Torah portion this morning and I'll point out where he's actually talking about relationship and where he's talking about repentance and where he's talking about righteous deeds. These three elements together help to overcome the evil decree or the accusations against us, leading thereby to redemption. In Jewish tradition, the archetype of redemption is the exodus from Egypt. The exodus is celebrated with the singing of the song at the sea, you know, the song of Moses. In Revelation, it says that the saints will sing the song of Moses in the last days at the coming of Mashiach. And wouldn't you know, in Exodus 15, where it records that Moses and the children, B'nai Yisrael, sang the song to Hashem, they said, I will sing. The word for sing here is sheer. And you can see Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed, Elul, even hidden, hidden within the Song of Moses, which incorporates all of these aspects. So this is something beautiful that's just hidden within the Hebrew that I like to bring out before we get into the Torah portion. As we go through it, you're going to see, I've made two columns, there's certain blessings that come from certain observances of drawing near to Hashem and His ways. And then there's the cause and effect of disobedience or living out of harmony. So let's look at this. In verse 26, he says, See, Ra'e. And in the Hebrew, this is singular. He's speaking to you individually and to you. Later, you see it becomes plural for the nation of Israel, for all God's people. But here he's speaking to each one of us individually. See, I am setting before you today a blessing, a bracha, and a curse, a kelala. The blessing, and in Hebrew it says, et baracha, the olive tov, which we know Yeshua says, I am the olive and the tov. It's connected by a dash to the blessing. So the blessing is inherent in Yeshua. If you listen to the mitzvot of Adonai, your God, I am giving you today, and the curse, now here, where it says kelala, there's no olive tov connected to the curse. Interesting that in the Hebrew, it would only connect to the blessing. If you don't listen to the mitzvot of Adonai, your God, but turn aside from the way I am ordering you today, and you follow other gods that you have not known. When Adonai, your God, brings you into the land you are entering in order to take possession of it, you are to put the blessing on Mount Gerizim. Why Mount Gerizim? And why the blessing there? Why not on the blessing on Mount Ebal? Wait. In Judaism, we ask a lot of questions. We always have to test all things. Anybody know what happened up on Mount Gerizim? 
this is where God first made covenant with Abraham and he showed him a 360 degree view of all of Israel and said this is the land that I'm going to give to you and to your descendants after you and so this is where the promise was made if you will keep my Torah there's this if then and Abraham it says he kept all of the Torah this is even before it was written down right so what's amazing is God takes the descendants of Abraham back to the very place where he promised Abraham that he would give them the land and that they would be blessed and he hasn't pronounced the blessings right there on that spot and when we took the group to Israel we went up onto that spot and we found the cave where Abraham spent the night and we saw the 360 degree view and then we looked across at Mount Ebal and we see where Joshua actually built the altar and the, the tabernacle first uh, stood after entering into the land and very amazing to bring this home it really brings it to life both are west of the Yardin, in the direction of the sunset, in the land of the Canaanite living in the Arava, across from Gilgal, near the pistachio trees of Moray. And sure enough, to this day, there's still oaks of Moray up there. For you are to cross the Yardin, to enter and take possession of the land Adonai your God is giving you. You are to own it and live in it. You are to take care to follow all of the mitzvot and the mishpatim, the rulings I am setting before you today. So how many mishpatim or how many, uh, like we've talked about before, there's 613 mitzvot in Torah, right? And some of them are positive, you shall do, and some of them are what we call negative commandments, which means you shall not do something. And do you know how many positive and negative commandments there are within Torah? All of these mitzvot, some of them we understand, some of them we don't understand. Some of them are mishpatim, some of them are hukim. But there's 248 positive mitzvot, of which there's only 126 applicable to us today because we don't have a temple and we're not living in the land. And so even within all of these positive mitzvot, there's only certain ones that we can keep in the land. What's interesting about 248, what's, anybody know what's interesting about that number? That's the number of ligaments and joints and bones that we have in the body. So it's to connotate with everything that we have, like that word meodecha in the Shema, with everything that we have, our whole being, let us keep all of the good things that we are supposed to be doing. The things that we're supposed to abstain from, the negative commandments, there's 365, one for each day of the year. So when you add 365 and 248, of course, you come to 613. Out of those 365 negative mitzvot, only 246 are applicable to us today in the diaspora and without a temple and without the priest. And because some mitzvot are for ladies, some are for priests. Uh, so there's only a certain amount of them that we can actually fulfill. But the beautiful thing is, all of them are fulfilled in loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and loving your fellow man as yourself. So in the Torah, out of those 613, another way that we break down these 613 mitzvot is we say that the first two, when Hashem spoke on Mount Sinai, and He says, Ani yod -Heh vav -Heh. I am yod -Heh vav -Heh. That's the first commandment. And we heard this, and then he goes, and he says, you shall have no other gods before me. And that second commandment is also connected with, and you shall not make any graven image or any likeness of anything in the heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters underneath the earth. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. It's relational. He's jealous for us to remain connected to him and no other. But what's amazing is after those first two, Israel, they said, we don't want to hear anymore. Tell them to just talk to you, Moshe. So we have two commandments there. The rest of them that Moshe wrote down in the Torah are 611. And so this is where we get the full 613. Two of them we've actually heard with our own ears, or our forefathers did, and 611 of them were given to Moshe and he wrote them down on Mount Sinai. In chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Here are the laws and the rulings you are to observe and obey in the land Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has given you to possess as long as you live on earth. You must destroy all the places where the goyim are dispossessing and serving their gods. 
So all the high places, all the places of pagan idol worship, whether on a high mountain or a hill or some leafy tree, break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their god. Exterminate even the name from that place. And do you know if Israel had done this in 1967 when they took back Jerusalem, we wouldn't be dealing with the problem of persecution over the Temple Mount and dividing the land that we're dealing with today. The al Aska Mosque on the Temple Mount should have been, according to this Torah commandment, taken down. But you are not to treat the to treat Adonai your God this way. Rather, you are to come to the place where Adonai your God will put his name. Where is that place? Where? More specifically, he places his name, he told David, on Jerusalem. And you can find that in 2 Chronicles 6, verse 6, where he says, I placed my name, I chose Jerusalem. For, and this is why at the last chapter it's talking about all men going up to Jerusalem three times a year to observe these different feasts, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. But here he's just hinting at it. Here it doesn't say Jerusalem, but later we learn it was Jerusalem. It says, he will choose it from all your tribes. So which tribe got to get the inheritance of the area surrounding Jerusalem? Judah. That's right. And you will seek out that place, which is where he will live, and go there. Now this is also where Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed. You will bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tents that you set aside for Adonai, the offerings that you give, the offerings that you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, and the firstborn of your cattle and sheep. There you will eat in the presence of Adonai your God. Do you know many of the offerings that we're supposed to bring up on the holy days are for us to eat in the presence of Hashem? What's beautiful about that is when it, throughout thousands of years, whenever somebody has broken bread with another, it's an instrument of peace. It's an instrument of relationship. And we have peace, a covenant of peace with our God. And we can eat. He wants us to eat in His presence, which is very intimate, very relational. It says, And you will rejoice over everything you set out to do, you and your households, in which Adonai your God has blessed you. You will not do things the way we do them here today where everyone does whatever he thinks is right in his own opinion. So now you can see Moshe moving from that, all the language of relationship and intimacy in the beginning of chapter 12 to now what would be repentance. He's saying you need to make sure that you don't do what you think is right in your own heart and in your own mind. Trust God, follow his ways. There's so many times that we justify not doing certain mitzvot, right? And we say, well, that's not what it means to me today, or that's not important, or God changed that, or as much of the Christian world promotes, the law was nailed to the cross. And so we're doing what seems right in our own opinion, and we're breaking this commandment. But God says, do not do the things the way we do them here today, where everyone does what is right in his own opinion because you haven't yet arrived at the rest. And this is what Rabbi Shaul is talking about in Romans chapter 4. There remains yet a rest for my people. That rest comes when we enter the land. They were getting this dissertation from Moses in the last month of his life, and they were about to go and take the promised land. And this is so important for us because we're about to go into the promised land and this is why Hashem is opening your heart to Torah to begin to write it today and then ultimately Mashiach will be teaching Torah for a thousand years in that land so that we can arrive at that rest and receive the inheritance which Adonai your God is giving you but when you cross the Jordan and you live in the land, Adonai your God is having you to inherit and he gives you rest from all your surrounding enemies so that you are living in safety, then you will bring all that I am ordering you to the place, once again, what's the place? Jerusalem, where Adonai your God chooses to have his name live. This is the second time he reiter reiterates it. Once you're in the land and you're living safely, bring your offerings up to the place where he chooses to place his name. And here it goes even further. It's not just where he places his name, but where he chooses to have his name live. 
His name is a living name. Your burnt offerings, sacrifices, your tithes, and the offerings from your hands, and all your best possessions that you dedicate to Adonai, and you will rejoice in the presence of Adonai your God, you and your sons and your daughters and your male and female servants, and the priests, the Kohanim, the Levites staying with you, inasmuch as he has had no share or inheritance with you in the land. Be careful. Here's a third time. A warning not to offer your burnt offerings just anywhere. This is what happened with the Samaritans. They started revering Mount Gerizim and saying, oh, Jerusalem's too far away and justifying, we can offer our sacrifices here on Mount Gerizim. And they still do that to this day. But he says, don't just offer your burnt offerings anywhere. That's why we don't offer burnt offerings here in addition to the fact that there is no temple. But he says, do it in the place Adonai will choose once again hinting at Jerusalem in one of your tribal territories there is where you are to offer your burnt offerings and do everything I order you to do and it was there that Messiah Yeshua was the ultimate offering and we see this hinted at you cannot have an offering any other place but it has to be in Jerusalem so as we go through the parasha we always like to look at the Peshat, uh, or the parties, and the Peshat is the literal plain meaning. Moshe is preparing Israel for the land, to enter the land, to live in the land, to be blessed in the land. And in the Ramez, which is just beyond the literal, we like to see hidden glimpses of God's character. And we see that in that he is an intimate God who's desiring relationship with his betrothed. But we also see hidden glimpses of Messiah in the offering that has to be offered in Jerusalem. And the application for us today is intimacy or relationship with Hashem comes through repentance and through righteous deeds. As we go down to the drosh, which means to seek deeper by comparison, we see certain enlarged letters, uh, like we looked at um, with Elul, you know, certain acronyms in the scriptures. That is one of the aspects of the anomalies that you find in the Hebrew. But also there's gematria, which is numerical uh, values that are given to the Hebrew language. And here we see that the word for bina, understanding, to see with spiritual eyes is to have true understanding. Bina in the Hebrew, you've got the bait and the noon and the hay, it adds up to 67. Elul, even to drive the point home further, how much even these Torah portions are built into the time frame in which we study them, Elul has an uh, gematria of 67. As you can see, the olive is the first letter, right? Lamed is 30. Vav is 6, and Lamed is 30. So you've got 67 hidden. In a Jewish mindset, when one word has a numerical value the same as another word, it lends deeper understanding to what that word is all about. And so this is kind of exciting to see all of this unfolding because here Moshe begins chapter 12 with dealing with relationship he's saying i want you to not go after other gods right he's a jealous husband he's saying i want you for myself it's not because he's selfish it's because he knows what's best for us he's the source of life and we can only have life eternal if we stay connected to him but then he goes into the aspect of repentance and here now in verse 17 we see him moving from repentance and that theme to looking at an aspect of righteous deeds what is this righteous deed that we're supposed to do in this month of elul he says, you are to not eat on your own property the tenth of your grain, the new wine or the olive oil that you set aside for Hashem, or the firstborn of your cattle or sheep, or any offering that you have vowed, or your voluntary offering, this would be like a free will offering, or the offering from your hand. No, you are to eat these in the presence of Adonai, your God. This is intimate language, but he's talking about tithe as a righteous deed. Tithing is very important if we are going to really put our repentance into action. We have to give to God that which is His. And ultimately everything is Hashem's. But we're just showing true acknowledgement of it if we give a tenth for His service, for His priest, for His temple, for His work. It says, 
you're to eat these offerings in the presence of Adonai, your God, in the place Adonai will choose. This is the fourth time he's alluded to Jerusalem. You and your sons and your daughters, your male and female slaves, and the Levi who is your guest. And you are to rejoice before Adonai, your God, in everything you do to undertake. Why is Levi a guest? Where God chooses to place his name is Judah's inheritance, but the temple is central. And the priests are allotted a certain amount of land around the temple. And of course, uh, they are given, if all 11 tribes come and bring a tenth, how much do the Levites have? 110%. So even that allows the Levites to not only have an equal portion, 100%, but then there's an extra 10% that they give to Hashem as a burnt offering. So they're able to tithe. It's really beautiful. As long as you are living, take care to not abandon the Levites, he says in verse 19. This is the way that we show our righteous deeds, our sadaka in action. So every Friday night, we have a little sadaka box and the children give of their money. And then when it reaches a certain amount, we usually send it to help the poor uh, in various places around the world. And so Shekinah has enjoyed doing that as a ritual in our family since she was born. When Adonai your God expands your territory as he has promised you, and you say, I want to eat meat, simply because you want to eat meat, then you may eat meat as much as you want. If the place where Adonai your God chooses to place his name is too far away, this is the fifth time he's alluded to Jerusalem as the place where he's placed his name. How important do you think it is for God to get through to us that Jerusalem is the place where he's placed his name? It's not just arbitrary. If it's too far away, like right now, a lot of times we're not able to go to all three times. We might go to one of those times a year. He says, then you are to slaughter animals from your cattle or sheep, which Adonai has given you. You eat on your own property as much as you want. Eat it as you would the gazelle or the deer, like something you've hunted. The unclean and the clean alike. Now this is speaking of people not eating unclean or clean meats. This is talking about if you're unclean, let's say it's a woman and she's in her time of nida, she may eat it. Just take care not to eat the blood, for the blood is the life, and you are to not eat the life with the meat. Don't eat it, but pour out on the ground like water. Do not eat it so that things will go well with you and your children after you. So this is a little hidden blessing in here. If we will abstain from blood, and this was one of the Noahide laws because the, the lust for blood grew before the flood and it got to the point where they were cannibalizing each other. So one of the very first things that he told Noah was your sons, no matter who they're from, Sham, Shim, Ham, and Japheth, they shall not eat blood. Yes, Steve? Yeah, they, they actually collected the blood, had drink offerings for blood, and they considered it quite spiritual. Yes. As well as making the blood cakes and things like that, eating these blood cakes. That's right. Demonic practice. He says none of this. Only the things set aside for God, which you have, and the vows which you have vowed to make, you must take and go to the place which Adonai will choose. Here's the sixth time. He said, There you will offer your burnt offerings, the meat and the blood, on the altar of Adonai your God. The blood of your sacrifices is to be poured out on the altar of Adonai your God, and you will eat the meat. Obey and pay attention to everything I am ordering you to do. Obey and pay attention to everything I'm ordering you to do so that things will go well for you. It's all about God desiring to bless us and to see us blessed. So he's telling us those things that will rob us of that blessing. It'll go well with not only you, but your descendants after you forever as you do what Adonai sees as good and right. Now, Moshe begins this theme all over again. See how we went from relationship to repentance to righteous deeds? Now, as he's finishing up this um, abstaining from blood as, as also one of the deeds that we should abstain from, he goes back into the relationship theme. Verse 29, when Adonai your God has cut off ahead of you the nations you are entering in order to dispossess, and when you have dispossessed them and are living in the land, be careful after they have been destroyed ahead of you not to be trapped into following them. It's like he's talking to a betrothed bride 
and he's saying, keep your relationship with the one true God and him alone. Do not follow after these other gods that the heathen nations will be worshiping. So that you inquire after their gods and you ask, how did these nations serve their gods? I want to do the same. See, if we're going to keep our relationship close to Hashem, this is one of the admonitions that we have to be careful of. You must not do this, he says, to Hashem, your God. For they have done to their gods all the abominations that Adonai hates. They even burn up their sons and daughters in the fire for their gods. Now, in this outline here, you can see... This is, uh, we've gone through 11 and 12. The blessings come from hearing and doing the mitzvah, the Shema. The curse comes from not hearing and doing. The blessing comes from eradicating idolatry and false names of false gods wherever we go as God's people. The loss of blessing comes from following false gods called idolatry and other names. The blessings we found in chapter 12 come in, when we come to the place where God will choose to place his name, when we bring our offerings to Jerusalem and we go there for the Moedims three times a year, we lose out on a blessing when we don't come to Jerusalem, the place where God has placed his name. So you can see this direct cause and effect, blessings or cursings. He also mentioned that we are to give what God wants for an offering. We're not supposed to do what seems right in our own eyes. We're supposed to tie the tenth of all that Hashem entrusts us with. We are not supposed to hold back what God has entrusted to us. We lose the blessing. We are not to eat blood. The curse comes when we do eat the blood. There's another place in Torah where it says, He who eats the blood will be cut off from his people. And lastly, we're not supposed to copy the habits of the heathens and worshiping their false gods. This could be likened to following the ways of the world. It brings a curse on us. We lose that blessing. Anytime we remove ourselves from Hashem's covering, which is life and love and blessings and health and prosperity, everything else is a domain of death. And that's why Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin, which is transgression of the Torah, all these things that bring blessings, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, our Messiah. So let's follow the same theme and look at chapter 13, where we see warnings about those who would draw us away. Moshe says, everything I'm commanding you, you are to take care to do. Do not add to it or subtract from it. Very important. How many times do we add to God's law? Quite often. And how many times do we justify subtracting from it? For the last 2,000 years, we see two different groups that one adds to it and the other subtracts from it. And Hashem wants us to walk that straight and narrow path of keeping His word. He says, if a prophet or someone who gets mess messages while dreaming arises from among you and he gives you a sign or wonder and the sign or the wonder comes about as he predicted when he said let's follow other gods which you have not known and let us serve them you are not to listen to what that prophet or dreamer says for Adonai your God is testing you in order to find out whether you really do love yod heh vav He alone with all your heart and being you are to follow yod heh vav He, your God. You're to fear Him. Now remember what fear, in a previous Torah portion, we looked into what fear means and what is it? It's a relationship word, isn't it? It's holy awe. It's in, um, infatuation. Yes. It's to be totally infatuated in holy awe for our God. To obey His mitzvot. This is like a husband who writes a betrothal covenant called a ketubah. And he goes away to prepare the hoopah for the marriage off of the father's house. And when he comes back, he wants to find out if the bride has been faithful, if she's kept herself chaste, if she's listened and obeyed his word, the words of the Ketubah covenant. And that's what the commandments are. That's what the Torah is. It says to obey his mitzvah and to listen to what he says, to serve him. And here's another relationship word, to cling to him. It's just like... 
your bride, loves to cling to you, hang on your arm. This is the way we should be as the bride of Hashem, clinging to Him in everything we think, everything we say, everything we do. This is total relationship language. And that prophet or dreamer, if he leads you away from following your husband man, you know, Hashem, and being infatuated with him, obeying his ketubah covenant, listening to what he says, serving him and clinging to him. Anybody who takes you away from that is to be put to death because he urged rebellion against Adonai your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from a life of slavery. Everything else outside of that covering is slavery. We have experienced true freedom in Yeshua in delivering us from our propensity to continue to rebel against Torah. That's the beautiful thing about the Spirit of God is that it truly does circumcise the heart and you want to obey God's commandments and you want to listen to Him, to serve Him and to cling to Him. He says, if anybody urges rebellion, he is to be put to death. Anyone who brings you against Adonai your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from a life of slavery in order to seduce you away from the path Adonai your God has ordered you to follow. This is how you are to rid your community of this wickedness. If your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or your wife whom you love, or your friend who means as much to you as yourself, secretly tries to entice you to go and serve other gods which you haven't known, neither you nor your ancestor, gods of the people surrounding you, whether near or far away from you, anywhere in the world, you are not to consent. You are not to listen to him, and you must not pity him or spare him, because you may not conceal him. Rather, you must allow him to be put to death. Your own hand must be the first one on him in putting him to death, and afterwards the hands of all the people. You are to stone him to death because he has tried to draw you away from Adonai your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of a life of slavery. This is very strong language. This is because if people knew that this was the penalty for going astray, would they ever go astray? And there's no account of this ever happening, but God uses strong language sometimes because of the hardness of our hearts where we're at so that Israel would realize the severity of not being led astray. This is now going into an area of repentance. If you hear it was told in one of your cities, which Adonai your God is giving you to live, and certain scoundrels have sprung up among you and have drawn away the inhabitants of their city by saying, let's go and serve other gods which you haven't known, then you are to investigate the matter, inquiring and searching diligently. And if the rumor is true, if it is confirmed that such detestable things are being done among you, you must put the inhabitants of that city to death with the sword, destroying it completely and everything in it, including its livestock. Heap all its spoils in an open place and burn the city with its spoils to the ground. For Adonai your God, it will remain a tell, a tell is a heap of ruin forever, and it will not be built again. So when you see these places like Tel Aviv, what is that telling you? <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> It was a ruinous heap before because it engaged in idolatrous worship. And when we rebuilt it, what happens? Those same spirits inhabit that, and now it's the world capital of homosexuality and all manner of abominations right there in Israel. A tell was meant to remain a tell, a ruinous heap, never to be rebuilt. Then Adonai will turn from his anger and show you mercy and have compassion on you and increase your numbers as he swore to your ancestors. So this, these passages both have an aspect of repenting when we recognize that we've gone astray, but also there's certain deeds that need to be done to ensure that these sins do not remain with the people of Israel. He says, Then Adonai will have compassion on you and increase your numbers. That's part of the blessing. As he swore to your ancestors, provided you what? You shema. You hear and do what Adonai says, and obey all his mitzvot that I am giving you today, thus doing what Adonai your God sees as right. So what is righteousness? 
it is not what's right in our own eyes, but it's what's right doing in Hashem's eyes. And Hashem always likens righteousness to acts of loving kindness, serving our fellow man. He says, inasmuch as you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. So this is how we serve God, by serving each other. Now chapter 14 goes into the, the aspect of describing the clean animals. Because how are we going to draw near to Hashem if we are harboring any darkness or any uncleanliness? He has to first teach us what things are bringing a uh, defilement upon ourselves so that we can do away with those things. <coughs> He says, you are the people of Adonai, your God. You are not to cut yourselves or shave your hair above your forehead like they do, the pagans do when mourning for the dead. You know, the pagans would also mark their body to remember their dead loved ones. And this was the origins of tattoos. So we're not supposed to cut our body. We're not supposed to mark our body. And we're not supposed to shave our head the way that uh, they did when mourning for the dead because we are a people set apart as holy. We are the Kodeshim for Adonai, our God. Adonai, your God, has chosen you to be his own unique treasure. This is relationship language. It's like a bride is the most prized possession of the husband. You're his own unique treasure out of all the people on the face of the earth. You are not to eat anything disgusting. The animals which you may eat are the ox, the sheep, the goat, the deer, the gazelle, the roebuck, the ibex, the antelope, the onyx, oryx, and the mountain sheep. Any animal that has a split hoof and chews its cud, this is a clean animal that you may eat. But you are not to eat those that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof. What are some of these animals? Who has a divided hoof but doesn't chew its cud? A hog, yeah, a pig. And what uh, chews its cud but doesn't have a split hoof? What? A rabbit. A rabbit, that's right. One, and what's another one? Horse. Huh? A uh, camel. Yeah. So rabbits and camels, not clean, because it has to have both a split hoof and chew its cud. And then it gives us that example. For example, the camel and the hare and the coney are unclean because they chew the cud, but they don't have a split hoof. While the pig is unclean for you because although it has a separate hoof, it doesn't chew the cud. You are not to eat meat from these or even touch their carcasses. So Hashim goes even further. Don't even make yourself unclean by close association with them. Of all that lives in the water, <clears throat> you may eat these. Anything in the water that has fins and scales, you may eat. But whatever lacks fins and scales, you are not to eat. It is unclean for you. What's a good example of that? The catfish or the bottom feeders. They have fins, but they don't have scales. We're not to eat them. You may eat any clean bird, but these are these type of birds you're not to eat. And then he goes through a list of different types of birds of prey. Because these birds are eating other birds. The eagles, the vultures, the ospreys, the kites. They're actually the scavengers of the earth. They're not just eating other birds. They're eating all dead flesh. Just like the crabs and the shrimp uh, and the bottom fish do on the bottom of the sea. God has created certain animals to be filters. But you wouldn't eat the filter after sitting for a year in the bottom of your sink, would you? It's the same way Hashem has created it so that we can perpetuate life. He can clean the earth. Not for food. It's not even considered food. That's why even before the Torah was written down, do you know Noah knew what was clean and what was unclean? He said, of every animal, every species, they shall enter the ark two by two, a male and a female. But of the clean animals, they shall come by what number? Sevens. And the Torah wasn't even written yet. It was just oral at that time. So this shows that Torah is nothing new. This is something that's pre-existed and Adam knew it, Noah knew it, Abraham knew it and kept it, Enoch, all of these. So we can see that this is pre-existed. Many people think that this is a Jewish uh, thing to keep, uh, to observe what we call kashrut or the laws of cleanliness. But just like Shabbat, this is something from creation that comes down for all mankind. 
And then he goes on to list other kinds like owls and pelicans and cormorants and storks and herons and hoopies and bats. All winged swarming creatures are unclean for you. They are not to be eaten, but all clean flying creatures you may eat. <clears throat> you are not to eat any animal that dies naturally. Although you may let a stranger staying with you eat it or sell it to a foreigner because you are a holy people. See how he's distinguishing? Now, if those people want to be part of the holy people, there's a way for them to be grafted into Israel, right? They don't have to remain unclean. But if they're not even interested in being clean, and they're, you know, then it's like that text that says God winks at their ignorance. But he has given the oracles to a special called out peculiar people so that we can be a light to the nations. And when the nations are getting sick, and you notice that God's people are not getting sick, what do you think they're going to say? I want to learn why you're not getting sick. This is why during the Civil War, those that were Jewish, that had the um, habit of washing the hands, they didn't even know about germs. They had no microscope in 19, I mean 1864 during the Civil War. And yet all the Jewish, uh, the patients of the Jewish doctors were living and not getting gangrene. And all the other doctors who were not observed the laws of washing the hands, they would go from one gangrenous patient to another, transferring and cross-contaminating this disease. And they had a much higher death rate. So it's beautiful how just trusting God, even before modern science proves it to be correct, the same way with eating pig, it took modern science 3,000 years to discover, after Hashem had Moses write this down, that pork is actually the highest carcinogenic meat. That means, and that's on top of being the highest parasitic meat. So you've got two different health issues there. Carcinogens cause cancer and parasites cause a numerous host of other issues. But it took so long for this hukim, something seemingly un not understandable, that defies human logic. What's the difference between them? I don't understand. I'll just observe it by faith. And then they have health. 3,000 years later, we can see why it's actually healthy for us, why Hashem gave us this instruction. Yes, Jeff. So one other study that I found that all the animals that were unclean were the highest in uric acid. Yes. Which causes gout. 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 Yeah. Very good. One of the main causes of gout. Now this chapter, this is Deuteronomy 14. Remember in Devarim, Moshe is reiterating the whole of the Torah. He's kind of summing it up in his last month. This is the month before they enter the Promised Land. So what chapter in the Torah is he referring to when he's reiterating the laws of clean and unclean animals? Anybody know? It's in Leviticus. I'll give you a hint. What chapter? You should know these chapters because if, if a friend of yours says, well, where is that found? You want to take him to the source, right? It's not just that we're following tradition or uh, habit. Leviticus chapter 11 is the chapter that covers all of the clean and unclean meats. And Deuteronomy 14 is just reiterating these. And then it's amazing how all of a sudden he changes from this relationship focus of what's going to keep us apart from our beloved creator with being making ourselves unclean in verse 22 he says all of a sudden at the end of verse 21 it's kind of like he changes focus he says you are not to boil a young animal in its mother's milk now this isn't an issue of clean or unclean so why the change in focus because all part of relationship with the source of life we need to have compassion and if we're killing a baby and boiling it in its mother's milk which is meant to give life we are totally devoid of compassion and understanding why God has created man and animals to care for their young. So it's not an issue of eating, not eating cheese and meat together because even Abraham served curds along with the um, calf that he sacrificed to feed Hashem. When God came down and manifested himself as a man and he had two other angels with him, Abraham actually served him meat and dairy. So this can't be talking about meat and dairy. There's been some that have misunderstood this. This is talking about an issue of compassion. Well, I read somewhere as well that there was an actual uh, pagan sacrifice where they did that. They, they boiled meat in, in the ice. I read somewhere years ago. 
And there's a lot of crossover where they're probably copying things that they learned from the Hebrews, but they're doing it to false gods. So we know that it wasn't uh, in error because Hashem not only received it, but ate it uh, for Abraham. So we see another mitzvot in another place of Torah where he says, you shall not, when taking eggs from a nest, say you're out in nature and you find a nest in the tree, you don't take the eggs and the mother at the same time. Why? Once again, the only time you're going to catch a fully mature bird is when she's protecting her young. She's going to risk her own life to hover and dive and to get close. As you're taking those eggs away, she's trying to save her little babies. And so Hashem is teaching us compassion for the mother and for what's instinctive in the mother. So if you have to preserve your own life, that's one thing. So you take eggs, not to waste them, but to preserve your own life if you're starving. But you shouldn't take the eggs with the mother. Very same thing as not cooking a kid in its mother's milk. It's an issue of understanding and honor and respect for the mothers. Which is, I think, a beautiful thing that Hashem cares even for these intimate details. Because what is He doing? He's changing our mind. He's making us more receptive and sensitive. And that's what it means to be circumcised. To be sensitive to life in all its forms. We shouldn't unnecessarily cut down trees and waste the beautiful things that God has created in a symbiotic relationship with man to take the carbon dioxide that we emit and produce oxygen you know, man that wastes the resources of the earth that God has used for our well-being, what are we doing but actually killing ourselves? So if we had a respect for life in all its forms, animal, human, plant life, how great this world would be. It literally would be the Gan Eden, that's Hebrew for Garden of Eden. Yes, Bradley. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Your dad is a wise man. <laughs> Nothing like being put on the spot right in the middle. My dad says, is that true or not? <laughs> yeah. Then he goes into tithing again. Every year you must take one-tenth of everything your seed produces in the field and eat it in the presence of Adonai your God. How are you going to eat it in the presence of Adonai? You take it to Jerusalem. In the place where he chooses to have his name live. This is the eighth time we've seen him talk about his name living there in the city that he would choose. There we will eat the tenth of our grain and new wine and olive oil and the firstborn of our cattle and sheep so that you will learn to fear, to be infatuated with Adonai, your God always. But if the distance is too great for you so that you're unable to transport that first fruit offering because the place where Adonai chooses to place his name, the ninth time we see that, is too far away from you, then when Adonai, your God, prospers you, you are to convert it into money. So ideally what we would do, let's say we have a farm here, or like the Kolstrom's corn, you know, you have a tent that you set aside, you save up, you sell it, you save the money because you can't carry all these bushels of corn to Jerusalem. You take the money to Jerusalem and you buy what offerings you want to offer to the Lord and what uh, drink offerings and, and what food you want to eat in the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem. You rebuy it in Jerusalem so that way you can travel a long distance. But notice that he doesn't say, it's okay, you don't have to come. He's saying it's still important for you to come. You just don't have to transport all these goods. He says... In verse 26, exchange the money for anything you want when you're there. Cattle, sheep, wine, other intoxicating liquor, or anything you please. And you are to eat there in the presence of Adonai your God and enjoy yourselves, you and your household. See, he wants for his beloved betrothed bride to enjoy herself when she comes into his presence. It's kind of like when you go on a date. What do you do? It's usually around food, right? Let's eat together. Let's talk. Let's get to know each other. And there's no better place and no better way to get to know Hashem than to be in Jerusalem and observing his mitzvot. Yes, Kevin. Um, this is the second time, correct, that, that he eats the other times go to the... Yes, that's right. And he says, once a year, the second time comes, you do this. 
on the second tithe at a certain time? Well, there's different first fruits throughout the year. So we do it three times a year. In the springtime, we have the barley uh, that we bring as a first fruit before Hashem in the place where he places his name. So we have to come to Jerusalem at the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's unleavened because we're eating the barley, you know, pretty much without leaven raw uh, or made into flat cakes. The next time is 50 days later, um, Shavuot, you're bringing the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then in the fall, you have what's called the Feast of Ingathering. All of the fruits of the trees, the, you have the olive tree, the pomegranate, the fig, the date, uh, the grapes. That's why wine was included there. Um, last week, in last week's chapter, we saw seven things being mentioned. The wheat, the barley, the grapes, the figs, the pomegranates, the olive oil, and the dates, the date honey. So that's why it's three times a year that we go to Jerusalem, because there's different first fruits three times a year. Yes, uh, I mean, this is the second tithe. Oh, and the second tithe would be set apart just for your expenses to get to Jerusalem if you're living uh, far away from Jerusalem. So you can actually set apart a second tenth and that will fund your trip to go. So it's kind of like you prepare in advance so that you can make this trip three times a year. Otherwise, when those times come, we say, oh, it's too bad, I don't have enough money, and we justify not going. But if we really did set aside a second tithe, a second 10%, we would have the means necessary to go to Jerusalem and to observe this commandment. Very good point. So now he goes from this aspect of relationship to the righteous deeds of giving again. Look at verse 27. Don't neglect the Levi staying with you because he has no share or inheritance like yours. So tithing is one of these aspects of a righteous deed. At the end of every three years, you are to take all the tenths of your produce from that year and store it in your towns. Then the Levi, because he has no share or inheritance like yours, along with the foreigner, the orphan, and the widow living in your towns, will come and they'll be able to eat and be satisfied. So that Adonai, your God, will bless you in everything your hands produce. So even giving and setting aside for those in ministry, the priests, and for the widow and the orphans, has a cause and effect of blessing you. Yes, Steve. Can I share something I picked up in this last part about the relationship? You bet. I'm reading a book on marriage relationship from this rabbi. It's called The Garden of Peace by Rabbi Arush Shalom. Really, really changing a lot of my thinking. One of the things there, he keeps talking about that the woman actually is like the moon and the man is like the sun. I've said this before. She is reflecting him. So however she's acting, she's reflecting the man. Yes. And if we're in a relationship, you got something really hit me as I was reading this core portion. We're supposed to be the bride, so we're supposed to be reflecting the father. That's right. This is why the bride in Revelation stands on the moon, yeah. because the bride has no light of her own. She has to fully be facing the sun to fully mirror his glory, his light. So how can we reflect Mm -hmm. the Father, unless we know him and know his Torah and know how he wants us to live. That's right. So this really starts Beautiful. blending in to, this is to your daily walk. If we're to be the mirror or to be the moon, yep. in both cases we use both examples. And it really struck me in this relationship type portion of the Torah portion here. But that's what he's asking us to do. It's a principle. By beholding, whatever you behold, you're going to become more like. By beholding, we become changed into that same likeness. So this is why it's so important for us to dissect and share and clarify who God really is what his character really does incorporate and what things it doesn't incorporate. Otherwise, we'll end up emulating the wrong characteristics. And we are a bride that is mirroring, and this is the process of being recreated in his image. And so when we picture ourselves as a bride and we think of the earthly human male-female bride relationship, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this mirroring. That's mirroring right. His word. And ultimately becoming one. That's what Atonement is literally at one minute. This is his desire, is to have intimacy with the one creation that he's created in his image that he can have intimacy with. 
It's beautiful. This is the true motivator. If when we realize this, we fall so deeply in love with him, then everything changes easily. It's when you're not truly in love that you really don't feel like changing. And we also see that on the horizontal plane, right? In the human, if our spouses are not feeling loved, what happens? You might tell them an area that you think that they should change, but are they motivated to change? No, not until you be the example, you be the change and show that unconditional love of the Father, and then they reflect that, and the love is the great motivator that woos the heart to change. It's beautiful. So chapter 15 now, we are gonna see a few principles here, mainly focused on the Shemitah year. Yes, Jeff. I might have to take it back a few verses. Sure, go ahead. So if we look at chapter 13, I said a few, but I meant many. <laughs> chapter 13 and verse 7, 8, 9, 10, that section there. Mm -hmm. The gods of the other people. Um, it says in 8, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shalt thou I pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him, but thou shalt surely kill him. Thy hand shall be first upon him to put him to death afterwards the hand of all the people. So what comes to mind here is the woman that was thrown at Yeshua's feet. Yes. She was caught in adultery. Now the, the text says that she was caught in the actual act of adultery. So who threw her at his feet were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They knew where to get her. Mm -hmm. Yeshua turned around and on them and said, you without sin cast the first stone. Because they were involved in this, which was in a form of worshiping other gods. And not bringing the man. And, and, yeah, and not bringing the, but they, they were guilty of the same thing. That's right. And Yeshua showed compassion on this woman because you couldn't punish her without bringing the person that was making the accusation. That's right. Saying if you're not guilty of the same thing, you know, go ahead and throw the first stone because nobody else could kill her without the accuser showing that throwing that first stone. So he showed relationship, repentance, and right. All in one. All three of those. Exactly. Very good. And she saw no condemnation in his eyes. While he did not condone the sin, he simply said, go and sin no more. And this is the way that we should deal with one another when somebody's dealing with an issue of sin in their life. They're not going to be motivated if we just reject them or if we expose them or gossip about them or all of these things. They're going to feel like just leaving and continuing to do that. But if we can show the love of God in that kind of compassion where we don't condone the sin, but we help them to go and sin no more by coming alongside of them and lovingly knew, mentoring them. I think he knew by the Spirit that those people would not come forward and throw the first step. That's right. And then they had also their temple prostitutes. Yep. And she was probably one of the temple prostitutes because that's where they, how they knew where to fight them. So Very good point. And tied in for this, that they were worshiping other gods, which we know they were. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Now we move from this chapter on clean and unclean animals and goes into reiterating the laws of the Shemitah. It says, at the end of every seven years, you are to have a Shemitah. Here is how the Shemitah is to be done. Every creditor is to give up what he has loaned to his fellow member of the community. Now the laws of Shemitah are being reiterated, just like the laws of the clean and the unclean animals, except from Leviticus 11, where the clean and unclean animals are found. This is found in Leviticus 25. It covers the Shemitah and the year of Yovel, the year of Jubilee. It says that someone, a creditor, is to give up what he loaned in the seventh year to his fellow member of the community. He's not to force his neighbor or relative to repay it because Adonai's time of remission has been proclaimed. You may demand that a foreigner repay his debt, but you are to release your claim on whatever your brother owes you. In spite of this, there will be no one needy among you because Adonai will certainly bless you in the land which Adonai your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess. If only you will listen carefully to what Adonai your God says and takes care to obey all these mitzvot I am giving you today. Yes, Adonai your God will bless you as he promised. You will lend money to many nations without having to borrow and you will rule over many nations without their ruling over you. 
And do you know the years that Judah had to spend in Babylon and that the northern ten tribes were taken away by Assyria, this was the exact number of years that they did not observe the Shemitah in the land. It was like there was a direct correlation, cause and effect. So God here is also telling the bride that he desires us to be the head and not the tail, like Deuteronomy 28, 13 says. He wants us to be the lenders and not the borrowers. Why? Because when you're in debt to somebody, it's a type of slavery. And God's people are always free. He freed them from Egypt. He doesn't intend for them to sell themselves back into slavery. Now he goes into righteous deeds again. If somebody among you is needy, See how he's just going from relationship to repentance to righteous deeds over and over again. If one of your brothers in any of your towns in your land God is giving you is in need of something, you're not to harden your heart or shut your hand from giving to your needy brother. No, you must open your hand to him and lend him enough to meet his need and enable him to obtain what he wants. Guard yourself against allowing your heart to entertain the mean-spirited thought that because the seventh year, the year of the Shemitah, is at hand, you'd be stingy towards your needy brother and not give him anything because you know he's not going to pay it back if it's close to the Shemitah. For then he might cry out to Adonai against you, and it will be your sin. Rather, you must give to him, and you are not to be grudging when you give to him. This is a principle of giving. Another text says, God loves a... Amen. So he's saying, don't give with a begrudging heart. God is a giving God by nature. Love is giving by nature. If you do this, Adonai your God will bless you in all your work, in everything you undertake. For there will always be poor people in the land. That is why I am giving you this order. You must open your hand to the poor and needy brother in your land. And this is one of the three main aspects of true teshuva. If we're really returning to the source, and we know we have an unlimited source from the source that we're entrusted with, how would we withhold anything? So our giving is really proof that we have entered into teshuva, that we have reconnected ourselves, that we've returned to the source. It says, if your kinsman, a Hebrew man or a woman, is sold to you, he is to serve you for six years. But in the seventh year, you are to set him free. And it's interesting that this earth's history is about almost 7,000 years old. And for 6,000 years, we have been slaves to sin. But look at the key hidden aspect, our application of hidden glimpse of Messiah. In the seventh year, which relates to the seventh millennium, we are set free from sin. Through the living Torah, teaching the principles of Torah to us, we truly have Torah written upon our heart in such a way that we never need to refer to a scroll or a book again. And sin goes by the wayside. And this is why at the end of the thousand years, it says sin and death are destroyed in the lake of fire, along with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Because we are truly set free in the seventh year. Moreover, when you set him free, don't let him leave empty-handed, but supply him generously from your flock and your threshing floor and your wine press, from what Adonai your God has blessed you with. You are to give liberally to him. Remember that you were once a slave in the land of Egypt, and Adonai your God redeemed you. That is why I am giving you this order. But if he says to you, I don't want to leave you, because he loves you and your household. This is the way that Israel would be slave owners. Totally different than our Western mindset of what atrocities happened with the African Americans in America. When a man could not afford to take care of his family and provide food on the table, he would often sell himself to indentured workmanship to another wealthy landowner. And he would sell himself for seven years. You know, I'll be your servant for seven years. And this is what's called slavery in the scriptures. The Jewish mindset is if we have a servant in our household, we treat him like a son. If we only have one pillow, we give him the pillow. We treat him so good that they don't want to leave. At the end of the seven years, we set them free. Their debt's been paid. And they say, I want to continue to be a part of your family, much like Eliezer and did with uh, Abraham. This is the true way to treat people. You empower them. 
you don't keep them suppressed so that they're dependent on continuing to be a slave. They're actually free as a member of the household after that, and they can stay with you. Yes, Steve? Yeah, the first slaves in this country where this problem really started arising was a black man who had a black slave and a white slave. And he actually he decided the black slave was to be a permanent slave, and the government allowed people allowed him to do that. When, and they were they would go forward at a certain time and say, okay, I've served you for this long, set me free. And he said, no, you're a slave forever. And that was the action of some of the beginning elements of Yes, our deviating purpose. from and the Torah. From scripture. That's right. Uh, and so that's real fascinating. But it was actually a black man enslaving another black man. It was really a Amazing. It's beautiful to see these principles coming out of Torah because all of Torah is laws of love and caring for one another. He says, if that person that you set free does not want to leave because his life with you is a good one, then take an awl and pierce his ear through. It's a symbol right into the door. It's like making a threshold covenant with him and he will be your servant forever. Do the same with your female servant. Don't resent it when you set him free. Since his six years of service, he has been worth twice as much as a hired employee. Then Adonai, your God, will bless you in everything you do. All to, and then verse 19 says, all the firstborn male in your herd and your cattle and in your flock, you are to set aside for Adonai, your God. You are not to do any work with a firstborn from your herd or shear a firstborn sheep. Each year you and your household are to eat it in the presence of Adonai. Guess where? <laughs> in the place he chooses to place his name. This is the tenth time we've seen this referred to. But if it has a defect, if it's lame or blind or has some other kind of fault, you are not to sacrifice it to Adonai your God. Rather, eat it on your own property. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it, like the gazelle or the deer. Just don't eat its blood, but pour it out on the ground like water. So here in chapter 15, we've gone over the laws of the Shemitah and how they relate to our fellow man as servants and those taking loans from us. God says he will bless us if we follow this. When we don't, what happens? That loss of blessing, which also entails protection, we lose our protection, and this is why Assyria and Babylon was able to come in and take Israel captive and besiege Jerusalem, because all because of not keeping the Shemitah year. And now, in chapter 16, we see him specify these three times a year. He says, observe the month of Aviv. Aviv is a Hebrew word. It means green in the ear, when the barley is green in the ear. This is when we start our religious calendar. And keep Pesach to Adonai, your God, which is 14 days later, right, on the full moon. For in the month of Aviv, Adonai, your God, brought you out of Egypt at night. So everything moves from darkness to light. You are to sacrifice the Pesach offering from flock and herd to Adonai your God in the place where Adonai will choose to have his name live. Eleventh time. You are not to eat any hamats. This is leaven. For seven days you are to eat this barley with matzah, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste. Thus you will remember the day you left the land of Egypt as long as you live. No leaven is to be seen with you anywhere in your territory, let alone your house. So we know sometimes people clean their house and then they go and set their leaven out in their garage because they want to take it back in after the week of unleavened bread. What is that symbolizing? It's kind of like covering up the sin and having an intention to continue in sin later on. This is so symbolic that if we will actually not even have it in our territory, we would do well. It would imprint upon our minds the enormity of doing away with all sin. Well, they wouldn't sell it to their neighbors in the land, in the territory. It would have to be traders passing through, uh, heathens that, uh, yeah, they would sometimes sell it to the goyim. That's true. But they wouldn't keep it in the, or they were not supposed to keep it in the territory. He says, you may not 
sacrifice, the Pesach offering, in just any of the towns, even in Israel, that Adonai your God has given you, but only at the place where? Where God will choose to have his name live. The twelfth time he says this. There is where you are to sacrifice the lamb. What is this pointing to? This is a hidden glimpse of Mashiach. The Pesach lamb can only be sacrificed in Jerusalem. And it's going to be in the evening when the sun sets. At the time of the year that you came out of Egypt. You are to roast it and eat it in the place Adonai your God will choose. In the morning, you will return and go to your tents. For six days you are to eat matzah, and on the seventh day, there is to be a festive holy day for Adonai your God. So the first day of unleavened bread is a holy day. You don't do any work in it. And the seventh day is a holy day. You don't do any work in it. And it's kind of like bookends. It's commemorating this whole week of unleavened bread. You are to count seven weeks from the Sabbath after Pesach, you are to begin counting seven weeks from the time you first put your sickle to the standing grain. So as soon as Shabbat would be over, they would usually go and put in their sickle, and then they would start counting the Omer, 50 days leading up to Shavuot. You are to observe the festival of Shavuot, which is also known as the Feast of Weeks, for Adonai your God with a voluntary offering which you are to give in accordance with the decrees to which Adonai your God has prospered you. This is the wheat harvest. You are to rejoice in the presence of Adonai your God, you and your sons and daughters and your male and female slaves and the Levium, the Levites living in your towns and the foreigners and the orphans and the widows living among you. So what good is it if we keep the holy days ritualistically and we're not helping the poor? This says we have to help the widows and the orphans keep these feasts as well by giving them what is needed in the place where God will choose to have his name live this is the 14th time remember that you were a slave in Egypt then you will keep and obey these laws so if we see somebody encumbered by debt it's a type of slavery and we have compassion on them instead of rebuking them we realize we were once slaves in Egypt and we need to care for them the way we would have liked our forefathers to be cared for and then it goes into the third holy day in which we're to present ourselves before the Lord in Jerusalem this is called the feast of Sukkot you are to keep the festival of Sukkot for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floors and wine press so this is everything that's produced from May onward, May and June, all the way till the end of September. Yes, Archie. Going back to verse 9, it says, You shall count seven weeks for yourself from when the sickle is first put to the standing cross. That's the big ring. That's when the big ring offering is offered. That's the day after the feast of the bread. That's right. So, well, uh, it's, you start no, you start counting after the weekly Sabbath. When it says in Leviticus 23, you shall count seven complete Sabbaths, it says the day after the seventh Sabbath, you shall observe. So the only way is it has to be the weekly Sabbath, not the week of unleavened bread. It doesn't yeah. say that here. It said, from, uh, from the, when you put the sickle, they would do that on the first they would do that on the first day of the week so let's say like Yeshua uh, 2,000 years ago the year that he was crucified uh, Pesach was on a Wednesday and then you have Feast of Unleavened Bread um, the next day on a Thursday and the the sickle is going to be put in to harvest the grain on the first day of the week the day following the weekly Shabbat and this is when you start counting up to Shavuot. This way, every Shavuot, you are actually keeping it to the day after, and Leviticus 23 says it has to be the day after the weekly Shabbat. Seven complete weeks. That's why it's called the Feast of Weeks. And it wouldn't work as such. Like when you start with observing the day after the Feast of Unleavened Bread, then you get an arbitrary day midweek. It can't be the day after the weekly Sabbath. So the reason that Jews keep the 6th of Sivan today arbitrarily is because that was the day God gave the Ten Commandments on Sinai. So they're commemorating the day the way it was that year. It actually fell on a 6th of Sivan, and they're just keeping the 6th of Sivan arbitrarily ever since then. 
But if we are going to fulfill Leviticus 23, then it's going to fall on a day after the weekly Shabbat, after seven complete weeks. I, I would back him up on the idea and have to tie all of the scriptures together to refer to this. The, when you put the sickle to it, when you know all of those different things, they all do tie together to what he's saying. It's the first day after the weekly Sabbath. Because he uses the word Sabbath, but then they conflate that to say, well, Passover is a Sabbath, or Feast of Unleavened, actually Passover is a Sabbath, Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath. <laughs> So that's utilized as, that's where, that's what it says the conflict of Leviticus is okay. All right, but, but the, this, this has been a contention ever since it's, uh, uh, ever since before the time of the show. Yes. And it was decided by the great assembly before the church of the And that's where we have to decide whether we're going to keep the uh, Torah or whether we're going to follow the man-made additions afterwards and so we have to go through the mindset of what was God intending we cannot fulfill the mitzvot of keeping Shavuot after the seventh Shabbat if we don't start it in the right time and so this is where we understand why other people do things another way but we're trying to once again that's right Yep, which was the first fruits, which would have been the first day of the week, or right up, you know, right after sundown Shabbat. Yeah. So it fits in that year, and each year it's going to be in a different time on the Hebrew calendar. In verse 13, we go on to Sukkot. He says. After you have gathered all the produce of your threshing floor, there's only two things that come from the threshing floor, barley and wheat. So this is saying everything from Shavuot through the rest of the year, through the wine press, which is the last harvest in September, we are to gather and present at Sukkot as another type of first fruits. He says, rejoice at your festival, you, your sons, your daughters, your male and your female slaves, the Levium and the foreigners, the orphans and the widows among you. Seven days you are to keep the festival for Adonai your God in the place Adonai your God will choose because Adonai your God will bless you in all your crops and all your work so that you will be full of joy. Three times a year, all your men are to appear in the presence of Adonai, your God, in the place where he will choose. At the festival of Matzah, at the festival of Shavuot, and at the festival of Sukkot. They are not to show up before Adonai empty-handed, but every man is to give what he can in accordance with the blessing Adonai, your God, has given you. So just looking and summing up, in the Parsha Ra'e, we see spiritually, not just intellectually, but spiritually, all these areas of relationship with Hashem. And what Moses reiterated was they are enhanced through eradicating false gods in our life, not following the idolatrous errors of the Gentiles, and meeting Hashem at His appointed times. Even this last aspect of come to me where I've placed my name. Basically, he's telling you, come home, my beloved. This is uh, bridal language. This is relationship language. Even his holy days, his moedims, very intimate times. They're like dates. So we can put this underneath the relationship category. And we look at the issue of repentance, being returning to God's ways. And Moshe says, don't follow our own opinion. Help keep the whole house of Israel clean from idolatry. Stop serving other gods. We need to repent and do teshuva in many areas of our life. And then the aspects of righteous deeds that were brought out in this Torah portion are acts of kindness and tzedakah by tithing so that God's priests can continue the work of taking care of God's house. Tithe by setting aside a tenth of all that God brings across your threshold. Don't eat the blood. This is another way that we can do um, righteous deeds, to respect that life comes from God, and to have compassion for the widow and the orphan and the life giver, as we saw in the mother and the animals. So in the spirit of Elul, even this Torah portion is amazing in how it's covering the three aspects of Elul, relationship, repentance, and righteous deeds. This coming week on Monday starts the month of Elul and the 40 days of spiritual preparation before Yom Kippur. 
we can meditate on reconciling our relationships. If there's any relationship that you've had with somebody that has been broken, this is a perfect time to try to reconcile them as the whole house of Israel needs to be reconciled. There's a lost house of Israel and there's Judah and we're even doing a reconciling work in bringing them back together. We're to return to the one true God in repentance and we can perform righteous deeds over the next 40 days. We should, we should do it all the time, actually. It should be a way of life for us. But if you're not accustomed to doing extra acts of kindness for the poor and the widow and the orphan, this is a perfect time for fulfilling the Torah in acts of love. And you will receive the blessings that God intends for you. Our relationship with Yah is enhanced through our loyalty to Him. Repentance is returning to God and His way of love through Torah, and we exhibit His character of righteous deeds and action ourselves when we take care of His children. It's the same as serving Him. So with this, let this be kind of your meditation for the next 40 days as we count the days leading up to Yom Kippur. And with that, let's stand and we'll close in prayer and enjoy a nice lunch together. Abba Father, we thank you for revealing your loving nature, your character, and your desire to restore us to right relationship with you. Father, we ask for your help to be cleansed from all unrighteousness. As David has said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If there's any areas that we are out of harmony, Father, or any areas that we have erroneously attributed characteristics to you that should not be attributed to you or if there's any way that we have gone astray in our understanding of your scriptures father we repent and we want you to reveal to us only your words only what you would have for us what your will is and what your way is father we want to follow you and be recreated into your image and we ask for a special empowerment of your spirit of love that as it flows through us we would become more compassionate that we'd be more giving after your nature of selfless love that we'd be more caring for one another and that we would exemplify your principles of love in action and everything that we do and say father may we glorify you and may we be brought together in a cod in oneness as we grow closer to you may we grow closer to each other in your holy name we pray amen Thank <laughs> you.